it's so good when he strips everything away and, and there's him. So it's not about being better or doing better. It's really all about receiving the fullness of the love and goodness of God deeply into our hearts. You know, if we do that, everything else falls into place. Everything else in our Christian life works and flows naturally out of that. And that love is really starting to deeply penetrate into my heart and is changing me. You know, most Christians have heard over and over again how much God loves them. But I really believe that few of us have been able to, to embrace in our hearts anywhere close to the reality of the fullness of that love. And I don't think we seriously major on this, on receiving love. Now, maybe some are, you know, Domily's songs, a lot of them were about soaking in, in his presence. And there is a real move that's happening to major on it, but I don't think most of us really do. We work on, on doing better and trying harder, and we actually can put up great resistances and barriers because we feel we're unworthy or unlovable or afraid of more pain from opening our hearts. But without that love, we're noisy gongs and clanging cymbals and trying to do good work and having a form of outward love, but we run on empty. Jesus gave us the most practical command. He said, love one another, what? As, as I have loved you. And we kind of run to the love one another, but we forget the part about as I have loved you. And I really believe that the receiving part of the Christian life is the important part. Only as we receive the fullness of his love are we freed to love. Can, can we truly love? In John 1, it says, all who receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. And this word receive is lambano, if I'm pronouncing it right. It's not a passive verb. It's an active verb grab hold verb <laughs> and uh, my hope for today is that we make a bigger opening to our hearts and start to actively work on receiving and grabbing hold of his great personal passionate love for you you know if we do that I believe we're going to see profound change and a blossoming in every area of our lives. So I want to make this a little bit experiential tonight, and um, I hope you don't mind if I personalize some of the scripture passages. Would that be okay with you? So I've revised them a little to make them personalized, okay? So if you could put your hand on your heart and uh, just repeat after me, Jesus and Father God, I open my inner being, the depths of my heart, to the reality and experience, to the fullness of your love. I will no longer resist, or deny, or put up defenses. I surrender to receiving your great love for me. So, uh, you know, as far as proclamations, uh, it says in Romans 10.10, 10, for one believes with his heart and is justified and declares with his mouth and is saved. So there's really a big part of the process is declaring and saying it, agreeing, agreeing with God. We're basically confessing agreement with what God says, and it's very powerful. You know, God is frequently talked about as immovable and, and unchangeable, isn't he? You kind of get the picture from that, though, of a stoic, unemotional God. Nothing affects him. 
But nothing could be further from the truth. You know, a very familiar verse that I love, Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord has appeared as of old, saying, yes, I have loved you. And I want you to take each one of these verses personal tonight. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. You know, this is not God sitting in heaven yawning. This is the heart yearning of God for you. The unchangeableness of God is not about his stoic, stoicity or however you say that. <laughs> it's all about his love. That's what doesn't change. His passion, his excitement from eternity past for you. Put your hand on your heart, close your eyes, and I hope it's okay if I ask you to see Father God's face and smile. Just close your eyes and see if you can see his face and smile. And repeat after me from Jeremiah 1.5. Father God, before you formed me in the womb, you knew me. You have loved me with an everlasting love, with loving kindness. You drew me to you. So continue repeating from Ephesians 1.6. Long before you laid down earth's foundations, you had me in mind, had settled on me as the focus of your love, to be made whole and holy by your love. Long, long ago, you decided to adopt me into your family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure you took in planning this. Okay. God had you personally in mind, had you as his focus. You're at the center of his grand plan. You know, there's this passage uh, about the pearl of great price that the landowner sells all his property to buy this pearl. And of course, it does refer to Jesus, but I think it also has a very great meaning of God selling all that he had, giving all that he had to purchase you a pearl, his pearl of great price. He wants you. He desires you. You know, many theologians say God doesn't need anything. That he's satisfied. That he's utterly complete and satisfied in himself. Well, Christine and I had a family with two boys. They're here. Brennan and Mark. And we were happy. We we're satisfied with that family. Great family. Wonderful family. Yet, we had this idea, we'd like a daughter, you know, like maybe a seven-year-old daughter, and we're thinking about, you know, adopting a daughter. And we prayed about it, and I'm not going to make this story long, I could, but God said, I've got someone prepared for you. And uh, one, one day in Sunday school class, this gentleman stood up and said, um, I have a granddaughter that I can't take care of anymore. She's an orphan. And I knew that that was the one. And from the moment we knew about Amanda, our heart was incomplete until she was part of our family, until, you know, until she loved us. You know, it took quite a while. It took uh, maybe four or five years before that really happened, and our hearts were hurting during that time of her not returning our love. But we didn't really, we were satisfied. We didn't really need to open up our hearts. And God didn't need to open up his heart. He is complete. But he did. He decided he needed you. He wanted you. And until you return that love, I believe there's a part of his heart that is incomplete and aching. 
The second part of Jeremiah 31.3 says he has drawn you with loving kindness. You know, this is his whole attitude and approach to us. You know, a lot of times uh, we think of anger, upset, disapproval, or maybe indifference from God. But this, this word, um, loving kindness, is kesed, the compassionate, which means alongside passionate, gracious, faithful, tender love of God. And you know, by Jesus dying on the cross, by God himself dying on the cross, he's taken away every obstacle to just pouring his love upon you. There is nothing in the way anymore. He can just love on you. And it's an everlasting love. Isaiah 54, I want you to put your hand on your heart. And um, no, yeah, put your hand on your heart, and I'm going to read it to you. So receive. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. How many of you believe you are sons and daughters of God, just like Jesus? You know, the words that Father God spoke to Jesus at his baptism, I believe were very powerful and very foundational. I think they were the grounding that allowed him to live his ministry and live his life and even allowed him to go to the cross and um, he says th the same words to us, okay? So put your hand on your heart and close your eyes. See him smile and speak these words. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And Isaiah 22 adds, in whom my soul delights. Let that wash over you. And let's repeat it back to him. I am your beloved son, in whom your soul delights, in whom you are well pleased. How many of you have trouble fully receiving that? Anybody have trouble? Yeah, I did too. How could God be pleased with me? How could he delight in me? Because I didn't. You know, let's see if we can attempt to pull down some of, the, some of these barriers. You know, first, we feel guilty. We fall short. We all outright sin. We don't feel worthy to be loved. How many of you go through those kind of cycles? Anybody? Well, his love and acceptance is not about our performance. It's not about our faults. It's about us, just us. You know, you remember that prodigal son covered with pig, pig slop? He had squandered his father's fortune. And all the father could see was his beloved son. I mean, he ran to his beloved son. He hugged him. He, uh, he was so thrilled that his son had come home. You know, he was full of joy. He was full of delight. And all he could do was have a party. You know, I was listening to a sermon Saturday night, and he said, when God looks at you, he doesn't see the sinful, real you. He sees Jesus. Well, frankly, I don't think God fools himself. I give God some credit. I hug a lot of homeless. Christine can attest to that. You know, and sometimes I smell the booze and the lack of a bath and see the tattered clothes and the sometimes not so good behavior. But I love them. I truly love them. Mary Ann's nodding. You love them, don't you? Why? Because you see inside. You see who they really are. You know them. And you love that, that beautiful person, that lovely person that's inside. 
Surely God is better at seeing you than I am about seeing a homeless person. But Ron, don't my sin and shortcomings at least temporarily separate me from a holy God? Doesn't it say that in Isaiah 59 too? Well, yes, it does say that. And without Christ, it is true. But the, the essence of the good news is that sin no longer separates. It's taken care of. Our sin past, our sin present, and our sin future cannot separate us from him or his love. You know, he says, I will never leave you or never forsake you. He means it. So hand on heart and repeat with me. Maybe you can close your eyes and focus on him. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including my sin and my shortcoming, can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I want you to take that to heart. He has purchased the right to always, no matter what, you know, that was in your a song tonight, he's on our side. He's not, never against us. I don't care where we're at, what we're doing wrong, or what we're not doing enough of. He is always on our side. So hand on heart, repeat. If God is for me, who can be against me? Who will bring any charge against me? Whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? If you hear voices of accusation or self-condemnation, these are not God's voice. That's the role of the accuser, Satan. And we partner with him in, a, in our guilt. And we have to reject that voice. You know, that's one of the things that I've learned. You've got to come out of partnership with that guilt, with that self-condemnation, with those old voices. Hand on heart. <laughs> Romans 8.15 For I have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but I have received the spirit of adoption by which I cry daddy father you know repentance is actually lining up with what God says Met metanoia that's what the word means the problem is that most of us think it's okay to criticize and condemn and put ourselves down. We think it's good for us. But it's partnering with the enemy, and it puts up a wall to God's love. We must shut off those old streams. So let's just, if you agree with that, then repeat after me. Guilt, Guilt. accusation, accusation. self-condemnation. I choose to no longer partner with you. And just hand those to Father God physically. Just hand those spirits to Father God. And say, what do you have in exchange for me? Now I'd like you to listen. Because he always gives us something in exchange. That's the way the cross works. So hand on heart, repeat, no matter what, I am your beloved son, in whom your soul delights, in whom you're well pleased. You know, many of us push off love or can't receive because we believe we're unlovable, 
inferior or shameful. Certainly not beautiful. You know, that's something that God has, you know, I didn't realize that I really hadn't received that word that I'm beautiful. And just recently, God has really anchored that in my heart, that I am beautiful. And it's been pretty profound. God created you. So hand on your heart again. Repeat Psalm 139. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. However, without God, we are incomplete. We are lacking. We are weak. But the good news is Christ came not to point out our obvious faults and weaknesses, but to give himself to us to complete us. The word is very clear that in Christ we are complete. Repeat Colossians 2.10. I am complete in you, Jesus. And that word means to fill to the top so that nothing shall be wanting to cause to abound. This is the truth. This is a finished work. You're not like lacking and working to be complete. You are complete in Christ. He has completed you. He has perfected you. That, that, the words are very similar. Teleos type, type words. <clears throat> so I want you to repeat Isaiah 62, verses 3 through 5 with me. Hand over your heart and eyes closed. I am a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of my God. I am no longer forsaken and my soul no longer desolate. But I am called. His delight is in me and my soul married. For the Lord delights in me, and my land is married. For as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, my God rejoices over me. Yes, we may carry fig leaves, old tattered clothes, old mindsets, but our true self, the essence of who we are, is finished, complete, lacking nothing, and it says we shine like the stars in the universe, doesn't it? You shine like the stars in the universe. So hand on the heart, repeat Ephesians 4.24. I am a new man, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. You know, each one of you is breathtaking if your beauty were to be revealed. It says all creation waits longingly for the sons of God to be revealed. They're waiting. See, it's there. The beauty's there. But it just needs to be unveiled. Hallelujah. He created you. He filled you with his son. And you, the real you, are magnificent. God sees you. He gets excited. He dances. He does. He dances. He rejoices. You know, Jewish people, they, they like to dance a lot. And God says they're always rejoicing in heaven. And you know, I just see him dancing over you and rejoicing over you and singing over you and delighting over you. So hand on your heart and receive this deeply. Zechariah 2.8. For whoever touches me touches the apple of his eye. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to read the next two, just receive them. Isaiah 49, 16. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Zephaniah 3, 17. 
The Lord your God rejoices over you with gladness. He quiets you with his love. He exalts over you with loud singing. I've had God sing over me. I hope each one of you have heard him sing. You know, sometimes I've, you know, want to sing I love, you know, a, a, a chorus or something that's really, you know, and he'll sing it over me. So allow him to do that. A third obstacle can be past hurts. We've all been rejected. We've all been abandoned, betrayed, ridiculed, put down to some degree or another. And we don't want more of that kind of pain. Letting love in has a high risk of hurt. So we put up walls. You know, one of our, uh, I was thrilled Saturday night. I was just, I was just absolutely thrilled Saturday night at our homeless thing. There's, I won't mention the guy's name, but he's quite a bit younger than I am. And um, he had a lot of bitterness in his heart. And he was kind of a tough case because he was always complaining and life is bad and the sky's falling and, you know. And finally, I got him to forgive. He, he thought that his sister had ruined his life. Just absolutely, his life was over. She'd ruined it and he carried this tremendous bitterness. And he forgave her. And God's love came into his heart. And Saturday night... Uh, he was preaching to me. I mean, he really was. He was saying, you know, you know what, Ron? You know, nobody on this earth loves me like God can. He's, you know, they're, they're, they all fall short, but he never, he never does. And he's facing a jail sentence this week. He's going to court, and he's probably going to get six months jail, jail sentence. He, he thinks for something he did wrong in the past. But he had such joy, and he said, you know, I've got, I've got him in my heart, and I know he's going to carry me through, and everything's going to be all right. So, I mean, just love just totally changed this guy. He's happy. He's grateful. He's contented. <clears throat> just like him, I have found that Jesus is safe. <laughs> You know, how do you find that out? You find it out when you're not doing so well, I think. You find it out when you're, you know, you've fallen on your face and, and you've done wrong things or you've not done right things. And, and then you see the tender love and smile and encouragement of the Lord in the midst of that, and you see how very safe he is to your heart. And the walls start coming down. <clears throat> Isaiah 42.3, A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. You see, he knows inside your heart. He knows if it's broken. He knows if it's faintly burning. And he wants to bring it to life. And he's the tender one. You know, we do a lot of sozos, inner healing and, and deliverance. And, and I see how tender God is to approach those area, you know, the inner areas of the heart, to breathe life in. He never takes life away. He just gently breathes life in. I was watching a movie this week about a discouraged teacher. She had a girl in her class that wouldn't really do anything in the class. She was a punk rocker type and, you know, impudent and rude and ungrateful and this teacher didn't give up on her and she got to know her and she got to know her gifts and she got to see the beauty inside that that young girl and as this as the young girl saw 
that the teacher really knew her and appreciated her as she was, she started to open up. She opened up her heart. And she became a champion alongside that teacher. It was amazing. She blossomed. Jesus is courting your heart. He is, and he doesn't give up. He's better than that teacher. And she was great. <laughs> you are passionately wanted, desired, and desirable. Don't resist it. See his smile. You know, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know. He's always smiling at you. He's always smiling at you. He's never frowning at you. He's never upset. See his delight and his rapture and his jumping up and down over you. So let's repeat Zephaniah 317. You close your eyes and just see his smile. See his smile if you can. Just look into uh, Father God's face. You, my Lord, my God, are with me. You take great delight in me. You quiet me with your love. You rejoice over me with singing. I've got a few more, just a couple more verses here that I'd like us to, you know, take deeply into our hearts. How many of you are familiar with the Song of Solomon? Well, this is Jesus' love song to us. It really is. And, um, you know, we watch a lot of um, Hallmark Channel movies. I don't know. <laughs> and I'll tell you, there's, there is something thrilling about, uh, about love, isn't there? You know, we, we, we can keep watching it. You know, that, that relationship that happens, that love between a man and a woman, it's just so wonderful and it's so precious because I think it's a it's a picture of the you know the love that we're intended to have with the Lord so I'd like you to close your eyes and look into Jesus eyes and uh, first listen to this he brought me to his oh you can repeat after me he brought me to his banquet hall and raise the banner of love over me. So I want you to see Jesus bringing you, his bride, to the banquet hall and saying, this is the one, introducing you to his guests. This is the one, my beloved, my bride. Isn't she great? So look into his eyes, hand on, on the heart, as I speak for Jesus, Song of Solomon 4.1. Look at you. You are beautiful, my darling. Look at you. You are so beautiful. Verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me. You have captivated my heart, my beloved, my bride. You have captivated and ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my beloved, my bride. How much better is your love than wine. So if you want to, you can respond to Jesus. Jesus, my beloved, you are mine, and I am yours forever. I give you my heart, and I give you myself. So could you come up and play some music here? So I'd like you to maybe just spend, would it be OK if we spend f five minutes on an exercise, something like that? OK. And uh, Al, if you could maybe hand out those sheets. Um, they're just so you can write something down if you get something right now.
But I'd like you to close your eyes and get into the presence of either Jesus or Father God. Just come into his presence. You know, sometimes it helps to think of a time when you were close to him, when you were closest to him, when you really sensed his presence or could see, see his face or whatever, but come into his presence with your eyes closed. And I'd like you to ask him these three questions that are up here. And you can take your time in the order you want to you wanna do it. And if you, only, if you only get to one, that's fine. But what do you think of me? What do you most like about me? And what do you most want for me? And he does speak. You may get a picture, you may get words, you may just get a sense. And if you don't get anything, that's okay. Just, just soak in his presence. Just let him love on you.